So we were the members of the structure subcommittee and what we heard from you at last month's meeting was you wanted more of a discussion of the spreadsheet that we put together for you. So we hope this answers some questions. Please, um, if you can hold your questions to the end, that would be great. Um, but if something is really glaring and you need it answered immediately, please let us know. Um, so we will start with some basic structure options. Then move on to a couple of reference charts that Mike was able to find for us. Then we'll go over the chart, the actual spreadsheet together, specifically for the pros and cons that we've put together. We'll go through some examples, local and nationally. Mike's gonna lead us through the financial outlook. And then we'll go through some suggested next steps. So we'll get started with options. So the ones that we identified first were public charity, and I do wanna say other than the hybrid that comes up a little later, these are all definitions we took from the IRS website to make everything as clear as possible um, to get all this data from the same place. So under IRC section 501c3, a public charity is an organization that one, could be a church, hospital, qualified medical research organization, or such a research organization affiliated with one of those. Two, has an active fundraising program receiving contributions from many sources. Three, receives income from the conduct of activities in furtherance of the organization's exempt purposes. Or four, actively functions in a supporting relationship to one or more public charities. So this pretty good definition. Those are the four main categories. Um, and then the next one is, oops, there we go, donor advised fund. It's a separately identified fund or account maintained by a sponsoring 501c3 organization. Once the donor contributes to such a fund, and the donor doesn't always have to just be a person, that supporting um, sponsoring organization has legal control over it. So while the donor retains advisory privileges, and investment choices, the ultimate control rests with that um, sponsoring organization. Oops. A supporting organization. So this is under IRC 509A3. It's a charity that carries out its exempt purposes by supporting other exempt organizations, usually other larger public charities in such a way that the organization that is supported is effectively supervising the operations of the supporting organization. So there are three different types that we'll go through on the charts that are coming up next. <laughs> See, technologically challenged. Thank goodness for Mike. All right, so private foundation. So under IRC 501c3, private foundations typically have a single major source of funding, usually one family or one corporation, with most of their primary activity as making grants rather than operating any charitable programs on their own. A private operating foundation is one that spends at least 85% of its adjusted net income or its minimum investment return, whatever's less, directly for the active conduct of its exempt activities. And then finally, the hybrid model that we heard about through Mount Sinai. Um, while they are technically a supporting organization, what I took away from that conversation with Mitch was that they had applied for a PLR in order to give themselves some more autonomy and some more flexibility. Um, and so I think it's important that we consider these hybrid ideas as we're making our final decision. Uh, it's a private letter of ruling. So we'd apply to the IRS for this preferred status or um, special status.
All right. So in your packets, we included both of these reference charts. It's two different ways to think about how these different structures fit together under the IRS code. Um, and so you can see on this one, if you start along the top, it has the 501c3 designation. And then under that level, you see the public charity, private operating foundations, and private foundations. And then as you move down through that public charity, you come to the supporting organizations as well. And so then there's a test for the third type of organization. But we're hoping that this helps as we're reading through this data that you understand just how these are, how these flow through this chart and what they might mean for us. So everything that we're considering is some sort of 501c3, but they are different categories and as we were going through those definitions, have different features that we'll be going through when we get back to our spreadsheet. And this next chart was another really great way to think of this as well. And so we couldn't decide on just one format to give you, so we wanted to give you both. Again, so as we're thinking about these, whatever way helps you personally understand how these fit, I think is the best thing to go from. All right. So getting into our comparison chart, what we did here was lay out on the left-hand side the comparison options that we were looking at and then the four large um, categories go across the top so everything then goes down from there. And the piece that we really want to focus on tonight are the pros and cons that went through each of the four of these. Um, yes. Good to know. All right, so we'll start with private foundation. Um, so the pros that we came up with for private foundation were it really can be customizable with a fair amount of community control through the board of directors and really can do some customizable investment strategies. This really has a lot of um, customization, for lack of a better word. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can be done here. It's a private foundation, so it would be like the Ford Foundation setting up their own private entity and deciding what they wanted to do. Um, but the cons for some of this and things that we thought were important based on the resources that we'll be getting over the course of years for this um, uh, payout are cost for staff, cost for compliance, grant making and administrative functions, cost for bringing in expertise. Um, there might be lack of back office expertise, lower deductibility for gifts with this option if there are um, gifts that are coming in, if we decide that we would like the foundation to accept gifts. So while there's a lot of pros for customization, there are a lot of cons in terms of cost because we really have to set up a whole infrastructure to be able to manage that. And while it could maybe be done with one executive director, um, I think we really have to think about the kind of salary that we'd be able to set up for something like this um, and what kind of uh, applicants we might get for a position like this because it would be a lot of work. The next one is a donor advised fund. Um, these offer some customization with oversight though and maybe even some customization in terms of investment strategy. Um, and we talked about perhaps kind of segregating the money that's coming that has the first rate of refusal from Cleveland Clinic, segregating it out somehow from the rest of the money that's coming in just to be able to keep that 
separate and keep all of the accounting separate. Um, and if we elected a donor advised fund option, there's usually grant making expertise and assistance from whatever organization we decide to set up the donor advised fund through. There's usually not much of a wait time to establish it. Those can be established usually within a couple days. Um, and a lot of that back office support would be done through whatever organization would house the donor advised fund. So some of the cons with a donor advised fund are that distributions usually can only be made to a 501c3 organization, which may limit the ability to fund some of the projects that we might think could be important as we're considering the mission statement. Um, some grassroots organizations that aren't necessarily established as a 501c3 yet, if we went with this option, it wouldn't be able to make a grant to those types of organizations. For supporting organizations, um, some of the pros here is there's, like with a donor advice fund, there's possible customization, some customization with investment strategies, and there would be a lot of enhanced services that might be available, hopefully with grant making expertise, back office support, um, so that is attractive. But the con there is the time to establish could be over one year. So I know um, just from practice, some of the supporting organizations that I've worked with, they are taking right about that year mark or more to be established once you apply for IRS approval. Um, the other con here is that depending on what kind of organization we might align ourselves with, the um, structure of the board, they might need to have more board seats than we might be willing to give up in an option like this. So that's something really for us to consider carefully. And then the last, public charity. There'd be a lot of customizable control through board of directors, ability to receive donations, which might be important for us as we're moving forward. I um, think that's a good piece that we really need to consider is do we um, think that the community might be willing to support this? And Phyllis, I don't know if that came up at all. So that's something I think as we move forward talking with the community is something we need to kind of gauge interest and in maybe just in our own conversations. Um, the one nice thing that we learned in some of the research is that if we go a public charity route and we're approved by the IRS, we really have about five years to um, establish a donor base. So I think that's something that might be important for us as a group. And then for cons, for with public charity, again, it's cost for staff, cost for compliance, any grant making and administrative functions for that expertise, back office expertise. Um, and again, like we were saying, that fundraising would be so integral to having this established as a public charity. And we'd have that five years, but we'd also have to come up with a contingency plan if that five years wasn't um, fruitful in terms of showing that we had that base.
information that they don't publish. Basically, if you think about it, you can't really click on it. Yeah, yeah. But basically, if you think about it, like the investment income that comes in, okay. you know, you have to have a third of your total income come from smaller donors or revenue. We'll basically, call it. So there's at least a third of whatever your annual investment can come. Basically. From a potentially generous investor. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I Is it possible to start out as one and then transition to another? When you're by spun first, we don't have as much money, but right into a bylaw somewhere that in 10 years you're going to turn into a private foundation. Is that a thing you can do? Yeah, I'm not sure that's assumed to, to. Not signed on. Yeah, yeah. true. So we came up with some structure examples. So as we're thinking about this, just some um, examples for each category under public charities, um, locally, like Catholic Charities has a very big presence here, university hospitals, and nationally, the American Red Cross, Salvation Army. In terms of donor advised funds, there are donor advised funds housed at the Cleveland Foundation, Community West Foundation, the Jewish Federation of Cleveland, but nationally, all the research I see is that there's so much money tied up in these Fidelity Charitables, Vanguard, the American Endowment Foundation, which is actually headquartered here in the Cleveland area. So there are other options. We don't have to stick with a local community foundation if we're looking for something. Yep. So supporting organizations, I know locally that um, like the Thatcher Fund of the Cleveland Foundation has made a lot of donations to places um, in the area. I didn't know any national ones, if anybody knew national ones that we should be looking at as an example. But you can let us know offline too. Private foundations, locally the Gun Foundation was a great example that's here in Cleveland and nationally I was thinking big like Bill and Melinda Gates, Ford Foundation, which we mentioned before. Private operating foundations. Yep. And they are private foundations, they're not any sort of hybrid? Okay. Thank you. So private operating foundations. So locally there are a lot of CDCs, which are the community development corporations that are formed as private operating foundations. So they really are handing out the majority of the money that's coming to them, whether it's through donations or a federal block grant or some other, <coughs> excuse me, form of income. And then the hybrids, again, I think we were all really um, interested in what Mount Sinai, what Mitch had to say last week. I just didn't realize that something like that existed, so I think we need to really think about different options that we have available. 
So I'm going to turn it over to Mike and the financials. So just so before we go through this, so you understand what the assumptions are that we ran with, uh, we are going that there's no additional gifting or fundraising dollars added to the money that's coming in in these scenarios. Um, as far as returns, we're using the 5% return. There's, there are charts that show four and six, but we're using the 5% as an average. We want to be relatively conservative. We're assuming no tax, but we are assuming net of fees. Uh, disbursements, we're always using 5% in these examples. Um, expenses in these charts are, are based on a typical size that we were given for uh, at the initial foundation size at an inflation rate of 2.2% annually. Uh, and then finally, the end of year balances equal whatever the beginning of year balance is plus returns minus disbursements minus expenses. So first thing we have here is the Cleveland Clinic contributions and kind of showing you over the first, as of 2030, uh, as of 2033 when the contributions would end, um, there would be a total of $301,000 dispersed from that money um, that year with a total of just under $2.7 million over the course of time as of 2033. Um, just those funds alone with no gifts or anything like that would have about a total impact on the community of about $7.2 million over time. The orange line is the total, uh, total impact. The blue is what's going on over time. And then this is a chart kind of showing what would happen there. Now in this example, we did use, in the last year there was $84,000 left and we just dispersed that over to the LHA funds at that point. Now these are the LHA funds coming in. If we did a special 5% uh, disbursement every seven years. There's no significance with the seven years. We just said every five to ten, so we cut it right down the middle. Uh, and you can see over in in this chart, actually, um, the number that you see on there is actually double what would be, you know, times that by two, basically. So in 2033, uh, you'd have $2.2 .2 million roughly dispersed. But, and then in 2033, a total of uh, $16.9 million, which is an accurate number at that point, at that, up to that uh, stance. And the fund would actually end in 2096 at that point uh, with a $68.8 million total impact on the community. The last year you would really see a million dollars would be in 2045 in terms of being dispersed. And then you start dipping into additional principal at that point. And that's just a chart for that. Now the cost in these examples. So we have we have two sets. So basically, in the first eight years, there's money being dispersed from whatever's left over from the Lakewood Hospital Association, and then for 17, 16 or 17 years, there's five hundred thousand dollars a year coming from the Cleveland Clinic as a contribution, which they have first right of refusal. So these two charts are separating those two? Exactly. Okay, that's where I got lost. And in this example, we're using a special disbursement, which you can see towards the middle there, uh, so you can see what the disbursements are there. You have about $60 million of disbursements uh, in uh, regular disbursements, and then about $8.5 million of special disbursements over the course of a lifetime. Um, we do pick up the cost here, because in these, in these examples, we have the Cleveland Clinic funds actually paying the the fees of or the expenses up until they deplete. We figure, you know, we might as well use that money to pay and let the community's money kind of grow. Um, and then this picks the cost back up in 2061 when those funds deplete. This is the combined impact of the two with the special disbursements. Kind of looks like a dinosaur. Um, you can see as of 2033, total impact's about $19.5 million, and then over the lifetime, it's about $76 million. So these are, I mean, in this kind of scenario, we are seeing, you know, this money can last a long time even without any contributions coming in, using an average scenario, and we, we try to stay conservative with our, with our assumptions here. You know, we, we talked about should we go higher than 5%, and 
ultimately, I decided I didn't want to go any higher than that just because I feel like we want to be really conservative with the money. And then this is the chart with the combined impact. Now this is just LHA funds without any special distributions over the course of time. Now the money does last longer, lasts about 13 years longer if we don't do special distributions. By 2033, the, uh, the total impact, impact on the community is $15.3 million. Last time a million dollars is dispersed is in 2061, uh, $1.2 million. And then uh, at 20, in 2096, uh, which is an important year because that's when the, when the uh, special distribution ones would be dispersed. You have an $80 million impact. Uh, by 2109, you have an $83.3 million impact. And there's your chart. Now this is the combined community impact with no special distributions. By 2033, you have seven, uh, just under $18 million. Uh, last year of a million dollar distributions are actually see the chart, so the screen is 2074, so it does, it does go a little bit longer in that situation, 13 years like the previous example. But the money does go out until 2109, and it's actually a 90 and a half million dollar impact. <coughs> and this is depleting it to zero at that point. An extra 5% being dispersed out for grants. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, giving the board some discretion at that point to do special distributions if they see fit, but only allowing them to do it every every 7 years in that scenario. So I mean, when we look at it, I mean, I think I think really we do see that I personally I look at perpetuity as my life, but it, obviously the community is going to look at it as throughout the entire life of the community. So this definitely goes beyond my lifetime, um, but it's a matter of what the community is going to look at, and this is assuming no gifting. What's that? I like chicken wings. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, when we look at it from this scenario, with no, with no, with no gifting or any or taking on any other donations, this is going to last a long time, you know, roughly 90 years. So, you know, there is a lo long time that this money can last. I mean, ideally we'd like to see it last longer, but in this scenario, w using the assumptions of a 5% distribution, um, this is likely our, I if we're looking for per perpetuity, this is our li most likely scenario. But if we want to do special distributions, you're looking at about a 13-year shortfall in terms of what this would do. So, I mean, that's why we, we said five to ten, and we just tried to use, for an assumption, we used seven, just to cut it down the middle. At certain points, yeah. So, I mean, we, you know, we, we looked at that sample just, just so we could look at it from that angle. All right, so suggested next steps. When we were going through some of our meetings as a subcommittee, we really we're thinking about you know what's happening in terms of the calendar for us and we really think that it's time to um, have some good discussion around a structure probably maybe starting this meeting going into the next and then really making an effort to present a recommendation to Lakewood City Council soon um, and we were thinking about that in terms of as I had said when we were looking at the chart, filing with the IRS for depending on whatever structure we choose could take some time. Um, and I know our concern is the money is supposed to, being, to start being distributed next year and we don't want it just sitting in a very low interest bearing account. We really want to have something ready to go as soon as possible. Um, and we were just giving an example of this time frame you know, once we present to the city council, we need to create an RFP for an attorney or a firm to help us set this structure up, set everything in motion. 
but we need to maybe allow three to four weeks for that RFP to go out, an additional two to three weeks to select a finalist, and then another two to three weeks for an attorney to draft documents to send to the IRS for our application um, with filing. And so that really does push us into next year, and we just really want to be cognizant of that as we're moving forward. Yes. So as we were saying, up to 12 to 24 months, depending. Um, we have heard of them being shorter, but we want to also be realistic at the same time. And that's our, those are our findings. We need private tutoring on the chart side, right? One-on-one. -on -one. I have a concern that I feel I have here, and I might be being overly optimistic, but it, it feels to me as if the Treasury decision is not going to be a My only, my only statement I would make to that is, no matter what our mission ends up being, and I, you know, I think that we're kind of on the, I, I would think generally we're all in the same boat. I don't know. Well, until we see Randy's report, we won't know, right? Um, but with the, with the community engagement aspect of it, I do think that gives us some feedback in terms of what we can, uh, in terms of what the community is looking for, and I, th I don't see it as. We, we determine a structure and then, and then we come up with a mission. I think they kind of work side by side as, as far as progressing. Right, right. Well, and that's, and that, that's why we're saying starting, starting in the next meeting, these are things that we need, to start, we need to start thinking about in terms of not only our mission, but also the structure in terms of the way that the shape of the foundation will go. But I also, I'll speak for myself. I don't know about anybody else in this room. I don't want to be sitting here two years from now. And, and that's my concern is that it sits in a, this money sits dead for two years while we're waiting for the IRS to make a decision on what we're doing. And that's, that, I think that's the main concern. I think the groundwork is absolutely not to Right, and we just wanted to kind of show the financials and the options available to us. That's more or less, you know, what our goal was here. Well, but, I mean, but we may, like you're saying, we may be three months from, tell me if I'm wrong, we may be three months from making, really making decision, major decisions in terms of those things. But Maybe we need not, to, but we don't know. Yeah, but we need, we need to start getting to the point, we need to start getting to the point where we're getting this train on the tracks because because we this this thing's been sitting at Grand Central forever. I just want to throw into this. Well, I have two areas that are important to me. And, um, so the first is um, I think there are some options if we don't feel ready to commit to starting an IRS process, but we want to be able to start moving. There's, I mean, I know it's like Grand Central also has all these regional intermediaries that are that basically where you get kind of financial advice from or you contact or provide all the back office functions, all the HR, you can do grant making and then when you're ready to become a whole organization if that's what you want to do, um, you can do it and I'm not pitching the place I work for but there are a variety of models like that that provide transitional structure for an organization that wants to be able to start working but isn't ready to commit to what they're going to be long term so that might be just worth a little research abroad. 
And then the, my other question is just, and maybe it's just sort, sort of just a little point on the L framework, because I feel like we're, this framing, which I really appreciate all the research you did, which is so in-depth and really helpful, um, is operating under the assumption that we want to create this for perpetuity, and I, I wasn't entirely clear if we made that decision, and <coughs> that, was, that was the goal. I mean, it sounds like, based on the feedback from the community, that there was an interest in that, but I, and, and I wasn't just clear what that means, but I just wanted to confirm, like, did we make that decision? No, this is, this is using the example of if we did went that direction. Okay. I mean, if we spend the money, then it's gone. So I mean, that's why we want to show how long would this last, right. so that so that we know. Okay, is it is it really worth operating? We'll call it as in perpetuity. Right. Okay. Yeah. No, I think it would just be helpful maybe to also understand what our options would look like. Were we not? I mean, I don't think it's like we spend all our cash. I don't know personally, but I, I, I just feel like it's another layer of options that would be just worth deciding whether we even want to explore it, because I don't think we've made that decision. Mm -hmm. One of the things that, um, that the, community, uh, the um, community discussions brought up to me that, that I keep like trying to wrap my head around is the idea that this foundation we haven't decided that this foundation is actually going to do anything. I think everyone kind of assumes that there's some great programs out there and some, and, and we've talked about this proactive strategy. I know Janine raised that issue with Mitch about if there's things that they see that aren't happening, they go out and do them. But I, I, I keep getting mired in that whole idea of, you know, we are not going to be the ones to say what this is going to do. And I, I almost feel like the community assumes that that's gonna be the case. But I do think, like we talk about that elephant in the room, we haven't explored like, are there foundations out there that are really on the cutting edge of making big decisions about the, and have really helping big things? I feel like we're kind of on this easy button thing and I see how it happens because we're in this like, this, the structure has to be done and we have to engage the community and we have to communicate. So we've set up the right stuff, but I don't know that we're really getting at the heart of, it. The heart of what we could possibly do. So that, I, I don't have an answer for that, but that's just, Every time I start thinking about this, and this brought it up to me again, like, what aren't we figuring out, and how do we get to that? Um, I would tend to agree with what with your statement. <coughs> I personally, I, I'm a public administrator, um, and so I think, you know, from an organizational standpoint, figuring out what outcomes that we want will greatly influence our mission, which will greatly influence the methodology for getting what we want done out to the community, which is where the structure comes in. Um, so I think maybe it might be fair to say that we need to kind of reorganize um, like or resequence um, and have the right conversations at the right time. Because really, a lot of these things do work, in, they intertwine. You can't really have one without it being affected by the other. Um, so I, I completely agree that, you know, Maybe we can work on resequencing and reorganizing how we're approaching the process. And that's at least what I'm hearing.
And I want to just add to that. I mean, I think I think a lot of what we presented here was just more or less trying to give you a timeline in terms of what would happen. Um, but I I also feel that you know any of the community engagement, whether it's the interviews or what what Randy's report will state, and even what we get from the public forum in a few weeks, I think that's really going to help us form our values as an organ as this organization is built to, not necessarily a purpose, but what our values will be. And that, and the, I think ultimately the values will give us our purpose. And if we don't agree with the values, well, we have a <coughs> yeah, we have a decision making process for that. We we agreed we agreed with that, uh, I would say unanimously, yeah. in terms of that like you know no, really no DAF, maybe outside of the Cleveland Clinic, funds. We just want to. I, I don't want to speak on you guys' behalf, but I think we what we look at is it's best for segregation of the two the two funds because because we don't want there to be any gray area where maybe the Cleveland Clinic set, comes in and says you know, hey, we need a calculation out. This is how much money we believe we still have in it and then get dragged through the mud in any way, shape or form. That if we keep them separated out, 
then we believe that we have a better. Oh yeah, right. But but no matter what, we don't want the money commingled into this one same account. You know, even if they are separated out, you know, two accounts or you know, ten accounts, whatever they are, as long as they're separate, we believe that's the, in the best interest of the community and and the foundation as a whole. Whenever, whenever the family health center opens, probably a year from now. And which is, yeah, and I don't want to quote you, but this is part of the reason why, uh, Doctor, you know, you he pushed big for we need to we need to start getting this process going. Yeah. Well, I, I and I do feel that pretty strongly. I do feel that pretty strongly. But this, but the things that you're talking about, what do we do? Are we going to have? Is this going to be dedicated to a program or to a facility of some sort? I do think those are major, major things that need to be cited up front. I have my own ideas about that that don't include those. And I'm, I'm much more interested in, in, a, um, in something that goes longer and in something that has a... I, I'm more concerned about how the board is going to be selected than who the face will be and what they will do. I, I, I want to... I wanna, uh, uh, an awesome, transparent way to select board members. And I think we should be careful about how narrowly we decide what the mission and programming of this stuff is going to be, because I think people who are not in the room are going to be the deciders. And, and I, 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 I would like to have a, a structure and a mission but uh, but how that gets implemented and, and you know that. so for, should we uh, should we dedicate all should we have a substance abuse treatment program? I guess that would be very nice. But um, you know if we want to spend all that money now, that's fine. I I think we ought to be thinking longer term, and we don't know what the needs of this community are going to be. And I and I think if we're careful about who the decision about how we're going to have effective decision makers on that board is a bigger deal than um so well, when we talk about the possibility of I, I am the when um Craig Trump ran for mayor I don't think I ever agreed to that you know thirty twenty um but I was hearing him talk about this whole proactive strategy where they identified issues and I would want to make sure that whatever our structure is that we build in that possibility of the board not just waiting for people to come to them um, to make grants, but that um, you know they're somehow built into that that we could identify needs within a, or the board can identify needs within our community and figure out how to meet those. Needs. So I think it's great you're, we're having this discussion. Yeah. I mean, I want to hear your thoughts, but we're not going to be able to make this decision when it's 747 right no. now. What I would like to know is how we're going to make that decision at this point. So are we, thank you, yeah. but are we going to move forward with, at our next meeting, really starting to build some consensus around structure? Do we need to go with talking about some mission slash vision first? Do we need to talk about the perpetuity versus short term first? I kind of think it's mission vision first. Really, really saying what the frick are we doing here? Excuse me, public hearing. Um, and then I think that will inform a discussion on the perpetuity versus um, versus short term because we'll be able to make a decision on that. And having all this in the back of our mind will be awesome. Yeah, yeah. And if we were doing the other one first, then we would miss this and we would say we should have done it differently. Right. I, I think the order doesn't really matter, right. but that's what's missing is pretty clear. So is that a reasonable right. so it's visual agenda? What the heck do we want? And then right. what's a very general way? What's very generally what the heck do we want? Very generally what the heck? How the heck do we get there? Right. And then drilling down to a really specific ask right. from oh, there.
We, we can make recommendations as to the type of, of funding. We actually started some of those conversations. Prevention, ver, you know, yeah, prevention, prevention longer term, policy. short term, uh, you know, is it gonna, you know, um, you know, diving a little bit deeper into, and again, to Ben's point, I think once we sort of establish the mission and, and, and vision, then the rest of it sort of flows. And you can be fairly broad in a, in a vision statement and then, mm -hmm. um, but to the point yeah, those that can was, be changed too. they can be. But but to the point that was raised earlier, we haven't really dove into anything more specific than that. I mean, we've had the presentation. Um, you know, have we said, oh, everybody in here thinks we should support, you know, half free food equity? We we haven't we hadn't decided that. So you know, so making those types of decisions is what direction, what um, you know, like Mitch talked about, what their focus areas were. Um, Yeah. 